Thank you all for coming. We're very pleased uh, today to have Judge Richard Gergel um, of the United States District Court for the District of South Carolina here to present on his wonderful and well-reviewed book. Uh, I say that because in part I was one of the reviewers. Uh, <laughs> Unexampled Courage, the Blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard and the Igniting, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Actually, it's changed. It's changed. Yes, and the awakening of President Harry S. Truman and Judge J. Wadis Waring. Actually, I'm I'm going to mispronounce Wadis Waring. Waitis. Waitis. Um, uh, I've been hearing about Judge Waring for for very many decades, and I still mispronounce his name. Um, we're very pleased to have him here with us. He's going to give us uh, a talk about his book, and then we'll have a short discussion among the panelists, and then we'll open it all up to you. Our panelists are the distinguished Randall Kennedy, who is the Michael R. Klein professor here at Harvard Law School, um, like Professor Tushnet, who I'm going to interview, introduce in a second. Uh, he was a former law clerk to uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall, who features a bit in the story told in the book, a uh, distinguished scholar of, of race and the law, among other uh, subjects. Um, to my immediate left is Professor Mark Tushnet, the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School. Um, also a distinguished scholar of both race and the law, legal history, constitutional law, and just about everything else. Um, I'm Kenneth Mack. I'm the Lawrence D. Beale Professor of Law and Affiliate Professor of History here at Harvard Law School. I did not clerk for Justice Marshall, but I clerked for his principal assistant, um, <clears throat> uh, Federal District uh, who later became Federal District Judge Robert Carter. Um, so we're going to have uh, Judge Gergel do a presentation on his book, which, which I understand includes PowerPoint slides. Right. Then we're going to have a brief response, and if we take it in order, Professor Kennedy, uh, Professor Tushnet, and myself, a uh, little discussion among the panelists, but we hope to open it up to questions from all of you before we're done. So you don't be able to see the slides here, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I may, uh, I may turn around so I can do this. Well, it is great to be in Boston and to be among so many friends. Uh, the, um, a couple years ago, um, the Legal Services Corporation Board met in my courtroom in Charleston, uh, and I gave a little brief introduction, and I shared a little bit about the place where everyone was sitting, and I told them about the importance of, uh, of uh, Judge Jay Waitis Waring and that the road to Brown versus Board of Education had, had started in this courtroom. And I told some anecdotes about Judge Waring and uh, Justice Marshall. And afterwards, um, I was approached by a woman I did not know who told me I've heard some of the same stories. And I said, oh, really? She says, yes, I clerk for Justice Marshall. And that's where I met uh, Dean Minna. And she said, well, you must come to Harvard Law School when you finish um, of your book, and so here I am. Uh, and then I have known, uh, Randy Kennedy and I share the same mentor, uh, United States District Judge Matthew Perry, and Judge Perry would spend a great deal of time with each of us telling us we needed to know the other one. And, uh, and we did, so I, Randy, 20 years ago maybe? We've been on all kinds of programs together for years. Um, Randy came to South Carolina and gave a lecture on segregation in Greenville, South Carolina, handing out ordinances of segregation ordinances that everyone in that room has never forgotten. It was really an extraordinary, extraordinary lecture. So it is really an honor to be here. And of course, Mr. Mack did a wonderful review of my book, a really thoughtful review um, in the Washington Post. And Professor Kennedy did one of the American Prospect all raising uh, just fantastic questions, and it's just what you look, love as an author is someone who raises great questions from the materials you have and make you think differently and originally about things. Well, let me tell you the story of unexampled courage. As the clock struck 7 p.m. on August 14, 1945, President Harry S. Truman assembled the White House Press Corps in the Oval Office. The ebullient president, standing behind his desk, informed the reporters that earlier that day, the Japanese government had unconditionally surrendered 
bringing an end at last to World War II. The reporters spontaneously burst into applause and then raced to the door to share this historic announcement with the rest of the nation. Thousands gathered in Lafayette Square across from the White House to celebrate, and soon there were calls, we want Truman, we want Truman. The president came onto the north portico of the White House to make a few remarks. This is a great day for free governments of the world, Truman announced. This is a day that fascism and police government ceases in the world. The great task ahead is to restore peace, peace and bring free government to the world. But beneath the veneer of America's grand self-image as the bastion of a freedom and liberty was a stark reality. African Americans residing in the old Confederacy lived in a twilight world between slavery and freedom. They no longer had masters, but they did not enjoy the rights of a free people. Black Southerners were routinely denied the right to vote, segregated physically from the uh, dominant white society as a matter of law, and relegated to the margins of American prosperity. Racial violence and lynchings festered just beneath the surface, ready to explode at any moment. And this uh, particular image was called the lynching flag. It flew from the national office of the NAACP each morning after a lynching in America. And tragically, in the first half of the 20th century, that was a common sight in Manhattan outside the NAACP's office. Black Americans living in other regions of the country had their own challenges. As the nearly 900,000 black veterans returned home at the end of World War II, they quickly realized that little had changed and they began demanding their rightful place in America's free government. Seen from today's perspective, the American triumph over Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement might seem to have been inevitable. The collapse of morally indefensible practices wholly inconsistent with the United States Constitution. But in 1945, with black Southerners almost entirely disenfranchised, white dominated Southern state governments resolutely committed to the racial status quo, and the federal government largely a passive bystander, there was no obvious path to resolving this great American dilemma. Something had to be done, but what and by whom? My book, Unexampled Courage, details the long overlooked story of the beating and blinding of Sergeant Isaac Woodard, a battlefield decorated African American soldier by the police chief of Batesburg, South Carolina on the day of his discharge from the military and while still in uniform. And the transformative impact of this incident on President Harry S. Truman and United States District Judge Jay Waiters Waring of Charleston. Horrified and inspired by the injustice of this brutal event, President Truman would launch a civil rights program culminating in the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. And Judge Waring would issue landmark civil rights decisions, including his great 1951 dissent in Briggs versus Elliott that would become the model for Brown versus Board of Education just three years later. Late on the afternoon of February 12, 1946, Isaac Woodard boarded a Greyhound bus in Augusta, Georgia after discharge hours earlier from nearby Camp Gordon and was traveling to Columbia, South Carolina and then to his hometown of Winsboro where he was to rendezvous with his wife after several years of separation. During one of the frequent stops along the way, the, the bus would be going through rural South Carolina and as it hit each town, it would stop to pick up or drop off passengers. Woodard approached the white bus driver and asked if he could step off to relieve himself. At that time, interstate buses did not have restrooms, and Greyhound drivers were instructed to accommodate such requests from the passengers. Instead, the bus driver cursed Woodard, telling him, I ain't got time to wait, and ordered him to return to his seat at the back of the bus. To the apparent astonishment of the bus driver, Woodard cursed him back and told him, Talk to me like I'm talking to you. I am a man just like you. The stunned bus driver told Woodard to go ahead, but at the next bus stop in Batesburg, South Carolina, 
the bus driver, now no longer concerned with his schedule, departed his bus in search of a police officer to have Woodard removed from the bus and arrested. Woodard soon found himself confronted by the police chief of Batesburg, Linwood Shull, who responded to Woodard's effort to explain himself by striking him over the head with his blackjack and escorting Woodard off to the town jail. On the way, Woodard was repeatedly beaten with Shull's blackjack, ultimately driving the end of the baton into both of Woodard's eyes. The sergeant was then thrown in a semi-conscious state into the jail cell for the night, and when he woke the next morning, he realized he could not see. Later that morning, Woodard was taken to the town court and convicted of drunk and disorderly conduct. Accounts of the Woodard beating and blinding were reported in the black press and received nationwide attention when Orson Welles focused on the incident in his weekly program on ABC Radio. Mass meetings were organized in black communities across the nation to protest Woodard's treatment and a benefit concert for Sergeant Woodard in New York City uh, hosted by world heavyweight champion Joe Lewis and featuring such luminaries as Count Basie, Cab Calloway, and Nat King Cole played to a sold out audience of 23,000. Of course, in this image on the left side is uh, Joe Lewis and in the center is Sergeant Woodard. Meanwhile, other black veterans returning to their homes in the rural South confronted other incidents of racial violence, including racially inspired murders. No state prosecuted those involved in any of these racial incidents. On September 19, 1946, a delegation of civil rights leaders met with President Truman in the White House, deeply distressed by this wave of violence being inflicted against returning African American veterans. Prior to the meeting, Truman staff advised him that despite his desire to respond to the concerns of civil rights leaders, there was little he could do as president to address these incidents. Criminal prosecutions by the federal government for civil rights violations in the South were fraught with problems, most notably all white juries deeply unsympathetic to civil rights cases. And of course, the reason there were all white juries was that jury lists were, were pulled from voter lists and African Americans were disenfranchised. Further, Congress was under the control of powerful Southern committee chairs who were determined to block even the most modest civil rights legislation, including laws making lynching a federal crime. As the meeting opened, civil rights leaders urged President Truman to call Congress back into session to address the spreading violence against black veterans. The President expressed sympathy, but lamented there was little he could do because there was essentially no public support for new civil rights legislation. Leading the group was Walter White, the executive secretary of the NAACP, and in this image, he is to the right of president, to the right side in our image, looking at it, um, to President Truman. Uh, uh, he was then the executive secretary of the NAAC, NAACP, the, probably the most important civil rights leader of his day, and was Truman's most loyal supporter in the civil rights community. It was apparent to White that the president did not appreciate the gravity of the situation. White changed the discussion by sharing with President Truman in detail the blinding of Isaac Woodard. As the tragic story unfolded, Truman sat riveted and became visibly agitated with the idea that a uniformed and decorated American soldier had been so cruelly treated. Abandoning the advice of his staff, Truman declared, my God, I had no idea it was as terrible as that. We have got to do something. The following morning, Truman wrote his attorney general, Tom Clark, and shared with him the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard, noting that the, that the police officer had deliberately put out the sergeant's eyes. Truman made it clear that the time for federal action had now arrived. He further indicated he intended to appoint the first Presidential Committee on Civil Rights to propose a new agenda to address America's serious racial problems. Three business days after Truman's letter was delivered to the Attorney General, the Department of Justice announced the prosecution of Batesburg Police Chief Linwood Shull in the Federal District Court in South Carolina for the deprivation of the civil rights of Isaac Woodard. Meanwhile, the Department of Justice prepared the necessary documents to organize 
the first presidential committee on civil rights. Truman charged his committee in his first meeting on January 15, 1947, to be bold and to attack the root causes of America's deep-seated racial problems. He held the Co Civil Rights Committee's first meeting in the cabinet room to emphasize the importance of its work. In less than a year, the Truman Civil Rights Committee issued a landmark report to secure these rights, which graphically detailed America's profound racial challenges and proposed groundbreaking policies and legislation, including the ending of segregation in the armed forces of the United States. Truman fully embraced the proposals of his Civil Rights Committee, and on July 26, 1948, in the midst of his re-election campaign, he issued Executive Order 9981, mandating the integration of the armed forces. The successful desegregation of the military marked the beginning of the end of Jim Crow in America. And my son, in looking at this particular uh, image, pointed out, he says, Dad, that's an interesting headline, but look at the one on the lower right. Posse bent on lynching searches woods for prey. And my response was, son, that was America in 1947. The Justice Department's efforts to prosecute Linwood Shull in the Federal District Court in Columbia, South Carolina, produced in the short term a predictable result. An all-white jury acquitted the police chief after only 28 minutes of deliberations. The case was tried before United States District Judge Jay Waitis Waring, a Charleston patrician whose father was a Confederate veteran and multiple generations of ancestors were slaveholders. Prior to the trial, Judge Waring was skeptical about the federal government's prosecution of a local police officer, but his views changed when he heard the highly credible testimony of the blinded sergeant who described his arrest and vicious beating at the hands of Chief Shull. As Shull's supporters cheered his acquittal, few noticed that Judge Waring's wife, Elizabeth, who had attended the trial, left the courtroom in tears. Judge Waring joined his wife later that evening, and both were traumatized by the trial over which he had just presided. The Shull trial forced the judge and his wife to stare directly into the southern racial abyss a view which would forever transform both of them. Waring later described the Shoal trial as his baptism of fire and his Michigan-born wife's baptism in racial prejudice. The Warings returned home to Charleston after the Shoal trial, resolved to learn more about the issues of race and justice, which the Warings had previously taught, thought little about. These were not subjects that could be openly discussed among white Charlestonians of that era. The Warings decided to undertake their own self-directed study. Each evening after dinner, Elizabeth would read a portion of a selected work to, out loud to allow the judge to rest his eyes after a day of handling his judicial duties. The judge would then discuss, the couple would then discuss what they had read, often while driving around Charleston in the evening, a favorite pastime. And people have asked me, my God, what did they read? And I said, well, uh, W.J. Cash, Mind of the South, Gunnar Myrdal, The American Dilemma. And American Dilemma is a fascinating book. It was a Carnegie Foundation study on race in America. It's 1,400 pages long. Gunnar Myrdal would later be awarded the Nobel Prize. It is an extraordinary book. I didn't understand that transformation until I read the all 1,400 pages. As, as it, once the Warings had finished American Dilemma, there was no turning back. As Judge Waring's new views, views on race and justice emerged, George Elmore, a black businessman, filed suit in federal district court in Columbia in 1947, challenging the South Carolina Democratic Party's all-white primary. South Carolina political leaders were united in their resolve to preserve the white primary notwithstanding a clear Supreme Court precedent, Smith versus Allwright, that made any decision recognizing, um, uh, uh, holding the white primaries unconstitutional. Judge Waring understood that any decision recognizing the right of minority citizens to vote would produce an intensely hostile and possibly violent public reaction. But Waring concluded that his choice was, quote, either to be entirely governed by the doctrine of white supremacy or to be a federal judge and decide the law. On July 12, 1947, Judge Waring issued his decision in Elmore versus Rice, 
declaring the white primary unconstitutional. Waring ended his order by declaring, quote, it is time for South Carolina to rejoin the union and to adopt the American way of conducting elections. The groundbreaking nature of the Elmore decision was immediately appreciated by the leadership of the NAACP. In a private note to Thurgood Marshall, William Hasty, who would later be appointed the first black federal judge in American history, stated, I have read the South Carolina opinion three times, and I still don't believe it. In many respects, Thurgood, I think it is your greatest legal achievement. But the segregationists would not give up. Soon a new party rule was adopted, allowing blacks to vote in the party primary so long as they pledged support for racial segregation. A new suit was filed, surprise, on, and on July 16, 1948, uh, Judge Waring summoned all 93 members of the party's executive committee to his Charleston courtroom for an emergency hearing. Waring denounced their efforts to defy his earlier ruling and explained that a federal judge faced with contempt had two choices, a fine or a jail sentence. He wanted those present to know these were the 93 probably most powerful political leaders of the state of South Carolina. He told those presents, if there were any future violations, there would be no fines. Thereafter, African Americans by the thousands began registering to vote in South Carolina. The response of, white, of South Carolina's white supremacists was thunderous. Death threats, written and oral, were constant. A cross was burned at the Waring's residence and bricks were thrown through their living room window. Time magazine described Waring as the man they loved to hate, but also noted he was proving to be a person of cool courage. If the purpose of the unprecedented vilification of Waring was intended to cower him, it did not work. Instead, he continued his study and reflection on race and justice in America, and became convinced that the foundation of Jim Crow segregation the Supreme Court's 1896 decision in Plessy v. Ferguson was legally, historically, and morally wrong. Waring, then approaching 70 years of age and likely retirement, resolved to play a role in overturning the separate but equal doctrine. Waring developed a plan to place a school desegregation case into, onto the docket of the United States Supreme Court, firmly convinced that a majority of justices would overturn Plessy if they directly confronted the issue. He noted on his trial docket a case from Clarendon County, South Carolina, Briggs v. Elliott, which sought to equalize the, the facilities in the district's profoundly unequal black and white schools. A classic Plessy v. Ferguson claim. When the plaintiff's attorney, Thurgood Marshall, appeared at the Charleston Courthouse, and by the way, this is an image of Justice Marshall coming off the train in Charleston to try Briggs versus Elliott, it was taken by a then 14-year-old young man who would become the greatest documenter of South Carolina civil rights movement, C Cecil Williams. He was 14, he was a little camera bug, and a family friend drove him from Orangeburg to Charleston train station to see the great Thurgood Marshall. He had one flash left in his camera, and he got that picture of Thurgood Marshall coming off the train. Marshall would later tell him it was his favorite picture of himself. Um, uh, when, the, when the plaintiff's attorney, Thurgood Marshall, uh, appeared at the Charleston Courthouse on November 17, 1950, for a pretrial conference for his case to begin in just a few days, he was advised the judge wanted to see him privately. I am sure he thought, what have I done, right? Um, and after being ushered into the judge's office and the door closed behind him, Waring told Marshall he did not want to try another separate but equal case. Bring me a frontal attack on segregation. Marshall responded pretty coolly to this rather extraordinary confrontation. Judge, this is on our agenda. It's just not tonight. We, we don't think this is the case. We don't think this is the time. Waring was unpersuaded, telling Marshall, Thurgood, this is the case. This is the time. Marshall urged the judge to think practically, noting that any decision by him overturning Plessy would be reversed by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Waring explains that since the challenge to public school segregation contested the constitutionality of a state law, 
he would request the appointment of a three-judge panel in which he would sit. Marshall responded the plaintiffs would then lose two to one. Waring agreed, but noted that any appeal from a three-judge panel went directly to the United States Supreme Court, and that's where you want to be. Waring's plan, Waring's plan was bold, even brilliant, but conflicted with the highly successful litigation strategy of the NAACP that carefully built one legal precedent on top of another, never trying to get ahead <laughs> of the United States Supreme Court. A few minutes after this dramatic encounter, Waring convened the pretrial conference in Briggs and publicly pressed Marshall on whether he was prepared to challenge the constitutionality of public school segregation. Marshall stated that he was and agreed to dismiss his pending suit and refile Briggs versus Elliott as the first frontal attack on public school segregation in American history. Although Marshall agreed to dismiss his original complaint and file a new suit, he had needed to obtain the consent of his clients to this change in legal strategy. Marshall had real concern about the safety of his clients if they took such a bold step in their rural and impoverished community, and he sent his top assistant, Bob Carter, to Somerton to discuss this change in legal strategy. I don't know, Mr. Mack, you ever talked to Judge Carter about this trip. He described it to me. It's quite a, it was quite a trip. Judge Carter told the large crowd assembled at St. Mark's Church in Somerton that those agreeing to join the new suit could expect to lose their jobs and suffer other forms of retaliation, perhaps even violent retaliation. He told them that there was no shame or embarrassment if any plaintiffs felt they could not participate further but that the NAACP felt the time had come to, to confront segregation head on. An elderly gentleman at the back of the church rose and stated, quote, we were wondering how long it would take you lawyers to figure this out, end quote. With only two exceptions, all of the original Briggs plaintiffs chose to join the new suit. The newly filed Briggs case was tried in the Charleston Federal Courthouse in May 1951 before the three-judge panel that included Judge Waring. In prior civil years, civil rights cases in the South were sparsely attended by members of the black community, lest they be identified as members of the NAACP or challengers to the racial status quo. But on the morning of May 28, 1951, as the sun rose in Charleston, African Americans lined up at the federal courthouse and down Broad Street as far as the eye could see hoping to observe what many thought might be the most Im important case in American history. Judge Waring observed the massive crowd from his office window, lady des later describing the scene as a breath of freedom. And my dear friend Jonathan Green, a great South Carolina artist, has painted this picture called Breath of Freedom, depicting the opening day of the trial of Briggs versus Elliott. And if you notice in the window, Judge Waring is standing out in the window looking out to the crowd. And I will tell you, in a conversation with, with Judge Carter, uh, he told me that as they were walking in that day and they were walking through this massive crowd, he says, Thurgood and I never had a crowd like this at a trial. And we're walking through and he says uh, that Marshall turned to him and said, Bob, it's all over. He says, Thurgood, what are you talking about? And he said, they're not scared anymore. The newly... Um, those in attendance in the courtroom were not disappointed by the performance of Thurgood Marshall and his trial team. The trial included the testimony of Dr. Kenneth Clark, a social psychologist who had done gr groundbreaking research on the effects of segregation on black children using black and white dolls. The crowd was also entertained by Marshall's devastating cross-examination of the state's key witness, whose last name ironically was Crow. Many joked that Thurgood Marshall, quote, sure loves to eat crow, and one observer referencing the state's renowned lead attorney, Bob Figg, quote, Mr. Figg got his law degree when he finished school, but he just got his baccalaureate address from Thurgood Marshall. As, as Waring predicted, the majority of the panel ruled that South Carolina's law mandating segregated schools were unlawful under Ple the Plessy Doctrine but wearing, were, were lawful under the Plessy Doctrine, but wearing fully aware he was writing a dissent for the ages, wrote an elegant and brilliant attack on the foundations of segregation in America. He concluded by finding, quote, segregation and education can never produce equality, and it is an evil 
that must be eradicated. Segregation and education adopted and practiced in the state of South Carolina must go and go now. Segregation is per se inequality, written in June 1951. Waring also praised the Briggs plaintiffs who he was fully aware had suffered severe retaliation for participating in the case, noting that, quote, they have shown unexampled courage in bringing and presenting this cause in the face of the long established and age old way of life which the state of South Carolina has adopted and practiced and lived in since and as a result of the institution of human slavery. Waring's dissent was the first challenge to public school segregation by a federal judge since the Plessy decision 55 years earlier. Some have asked how Judge Waring, a United States District Judge, could presume to overrule an existing United States Supreme Court precedent, Plessy v. Ferguson. Judge Waring did not believe he was doing that. The year prior to his great dissent, the Supreme Court decided three important civil rights cases. Um, one involving the separate but not equal law school in Texas, uh, Sweat v. Painter, another involving a graduate student at the University of Oklahoma, George McLaurin, and that was an exhibit in the, uh, uh, in the uh, court record. There is Mr. McLaurin. He was allowed to be a graduate student, but he had to sit outside the classroom. Tell me that isn't a stunning image. Um, and the third involving a challenge to segregated dining cars in interstate trains, Henderson versus the United States. In all three, the plaintiffs won in unanimous decisions. Some commentators thought these three civil rights victories represented a further whittling away of the Plessy Doctrine. But Judge Waring, reading them together, collectively, concluded they stood for the proposition that separate could never be equal. Waring viewed his dissent as stating explicitly what he believed the Supreme Court had already ruled implicitly. In early 1952, some six months after his great dissent, Waring announced his retirement as a United States District Judge, and he moved to New York City. Waring followed closely later school desegregation cases from Virginia, Delaware, and Kansas, all which were consolidated before the United States Supreme Court with Briggs under the title Brown versus Board of Education. And all the other school desegregation cases involving 14 separate state and federal judges, only Wettis Waring had concluded that public school segregation even if the facilities were equal, violated the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. On May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court handed down unanimously its landmark decision in Brown versus Board of Education. The court explicitly cast aside the separate but equal doctrine and adopted the per se rule that all government mandated public school segregation was unconstitutional, first advanced by Waring in his Briggs dissent. Judge Waring was always philosophical of what he described as the unpleasant repercussions of his civil rights decisions. In an oral history late in life, Waring observed, taking the whole thing in balance, I think I'm enormously fortunate. Because you don't often in life have the opportunity to do something you really think is good. I think a great stroke of fortune came down my alley. The other penalties don't amount to anything. They're offset by what I think is a really important contribution to American history. A little over a year ago, as I completed Unexampled Courage, I visited the town of Batesburg and retraced the fateful path of Isaac Woodard from the bus stop where he was removed from the Greyhound bus and arrested, to the storefront around the corner where he was beaten and blinded, and to the location up the street where the town jail and court once stood. Joining me on this solemn walk was the mayor of Batesburg and the town attorney both of whom had only recently learned of the Woodard incident from me. On June 1, 2018, the town attorney filed a motion to reopen the case of the town of Batesburg versus Isaac Woodard to overturn his criminal conviction. The motion was granted expunging Woodard's conviction. And several weeks ago, the town of Batesburg, Leesville, as it is now known, dedicated a historic marker candidly telling the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. Members of Sergeant Woodard's family traveled from New York for this ceremony, and the mayor publicly apologized on behalf of the town for the tragic events of that fateful evening, February 12, 1946. 
Unexampled courage is a story that deserves to be told with all of its pathos, its brutality, and its redemption of the American system of justice. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have brief responses. Uh, first by my colleague, Randall Kennedy. Just three brief points. First, um, this is a wonderful book. The presentation is wonderful, um, instructive, inspiring. Um, it definitely deserves a wide audience, and I hope you get it. Second, um, the book, in a way, is not surprising because for a good long while now, um, Judge Gergel and uh, his partner in scholarship, his wonderful wife Belinda, have been working throughout the South, but particularly in South Carolina, to do something that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. called for in his great letter from a Birmingham jail. In letter from a Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King Jr. said that in the future he hoped that the real history of the South would be written. And he talked about, he said, I, I hope that in the future the real heroes of American history will be brought to the foreground. And for a, a good long while now, uh, at least a couple of decades, this has been going on, especially in South Carolina, my home state. Um, the Gurgles helped bring to the fore a person who's, who had been completely forgotten to history, Jonathan Jasper Wright. Jonathan Jasper Wright was the first black justice on a state Supreme Court. It had been completely lost to history. And um, through the Gurgles' efforts, there was a wonderful weekend symposium uh, and uh, a portrait was uh, done and hangs now in the South Carolina Supreme Court. A few years later, uh, attention was paid, actually Judge Gergel mentioned this, Matthew Perry. Now for, for people who grew up in South Carolina in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s, Everybody knew Matthew Perry. I mean, if you were going to go to a civil rights demonstration, the one thing that you were told was take Matthew Perry's telephone number with you. Because when you were jailed, and this, is, this happened to my cousins, when you were jailed, this was the telephone call. Matthew Perry was the, um, well, Matthew Perry was the uh, Thurgood Marshal of the Palmetto State. And Matthew Perry then later became the first a black federal judge in South Carolina. And now in Columbia, South Carolina, one can go to the Matthew Perry Courthouse. And again, the Gurgles, wonderful weekend. Every political figure, uh, the, uh, the, the, the leading figures of the bar for two days um, celebrated Matthew Perry's career, and it was a really wonderful thing because Matthew Perry was still alive and could uh, enjoy this uh, celebration. And so now with, with this latest book, we have uh, another example of the true heroes of the South being brought to the fore. And one of the things that I like most about the book and it's, it's really accentuated by the title, Unexampled Courage. So it, one of the things that Judge Gergel emphasizes throughout the book is that, yes, Wadey's Waring. Wadey's Waring really is, the, is, is probably the, the principal hero of the book. But one thing that Judge Gergel points out is Wadey's Waring would never have been able to do anything. He would not have been able to do the good that he did without people pressing from below. And that is a theme that is brought forth over and over. You know, Isaac Woodard, the NAACP, in Briggs versus Elliott, Harry Briggs, 
fired from his job. His wife is her, his wife. He's is, a gas station attendant. He's a gas station attendant. His wife is a maid. She's fired. All these people are fired. But they are the ones that enable uh, the, the, the good judges to do what they did. Now, last point. He and here, I guess, I think, judge, that you're, you're, you're being, your, your reading of Brown is a, is a, is a, wee, blit, a wee bit generous. It's a great, it's, it, 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 it steps forward in a great way with its conclusion. But largely through your book, the next time I teach Brown versus Board of Education, I'm going to do something I've never done before. And your, your, I think your book's given me an idea. Compare Brown versus Board of Education to Judge Waring's dissent in Briggs versus Elliott. Um, and Brown versus Board of Education, frankly, if you didn't know much about America, you might think, well, what are they arguing about? I mean, you know, segregation is not, uh, it's, it's not shown to be the evil, the, you know, the social evil that it was. Um, but Judge Waring really uh, unveils it and is much more candid. It really puts it out there. And more passion. It's a much more passion, it's much more candid. Now, again, I'm not, there, there was a reason for Chief Justice Warren writing his opinion in the diffident, opaque way that it's written, but I do think it's, it's to bring that home, I think uh, you can compare, like I say, Judge, uh, Chief and, Justice. And remedy, and remedy. The well. remedy as well. I mean, uh, um, Waring really puts it out there in a way that um, is still, frankly. Segregation must end and end now, no all deliberate speech. Absolutely. So in any event, it's a wonderful book. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for a terrific talk and book. Um, first of all, I have to apologize. I have to leave before the event is over because I have to teach at 1 o'clock. Uh, second, if I had more time, I would spend a little on um, what I think of as the peculiarities of Charleston's white elite and how that played into uh, the, the transformation of Judge Waring. Um, the book describes his, mar his marriage, his remarriage, and the effect of the remarriage not just of his wife on him, but on their place in uh, Charleston. Uh, and I think that had, uh, as I understand it, had some significant effect on, on sort of the way he thought about the world. He was no longer embed deeply embedded in, uh, in the Charleston. He was an outsider. He had become, he had an, become outsider. an outsider. In, oh, but he'd become an outsider because of his marriage, or divorce and remarriage, not because of anything that had to do with OK. But what I want to focus on is um, um, Isaac Woodard as uh, exemplary. So in World War I, Randolph Byrne, an anti-war liberal, uh, wrote, war is the health of the state. And uh, we often think of you know, lines like, uh, during wartime, law is silent, and things like that. But one of the things that came out of World War II and the experience of black soldiers and sailors was an enhanced uh, confidence in their um, understanding of their place as citizens of the United States. So what happened to Woodard, uh, as, as uh, Judge Gurgle mentioned, um, happened to lots of returning uh, black veterans. Um, in Tennessee, a um, returning black veteran took his uh, mother's radio to a repair shop to be repaired, and he wasn't treated well, and there was um, a civic disturbance uh, that ultimately led to a large number of trials of, uh, of blacks, and Marshall uh, went to represent them, and I won't go into the details of it, Marshall almost got lynched himself as part of this story. Um, so the, the effect of the war uh, 
sorry, the NAACP had a slogan, double V for victory, you know, victory at, uh, abroad and victory at home. Um, the effect of the war was to not, um, it was also, I should, the effect of the war was the Japanese internment, uh, but also the, uh, I don't, phrasing this is quite difficult, the, not the empowerment of black veterans, but the uh, increasing confidence that black veterans had and consciousness. and consciousness of themselves as people who had done what citizens were supposed to do, which is defend the country. And they came back and said, I have behaved like a citizen, now treat me like one. Uh, and that happened all over the country, uh, all over the South, and had a significant effect, I think, on the, uh, the uh, renewal or the, um, I don't the increased uh, force of the civil rights movement from below. And so I just, I started with Byrne and Wars, the Health of the State as an anti-war person, uh, and yet there is something about civic participation in war that has uh, important implications for expansions of uh, understandings of what citizenship uh, is. And, and sort of my footnote on this, and I'll end on this, is um, uh, remember last election cycle, all the women veterans who were running on the ground, not on the ground, but in part because they had served the country in war and now wanted to continue their service uh, as, uh, uh, as, as elected representatives. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Judge Gergel for a wonderful book, as you know, I said in my Washington Post review. Um, I, I'd like to just elaborate on you know, a theme that I developed in that review. Um, you know, this, I, I agree with Professor Kennedy. Um, this is a history that has to be recovered and remembered and re-remembered. Um, you know, if you were a, involved in civil rights and you were a certain age, the name Wadey's Wearing would have been familiar to you. Um, by the time I was growing up, Wadey's Wearing was not a name that was familiar to people who had that orientation. I learned the name when I read the book Simple Justice when I was in law school, you know, Richard Kluger's epic history of the Brown litigation. Um, so, so history should be recovered and remembered and re-remembered. Uh, but, but I do want to develop a theme that um, the, the book recounts a redemptive history. Uh, you know, Wadey's wearing is, and, and his wife, Elizabeth, are in some measure redeemed. Um, you know, this terrible thing happens to Isaac Woodard, and we shouldn't lose his story in the narrative. And if we have time for questions, I'm sure a lot of you will ask, you know, what happened to Isaac Woodard? Um, terrible thing happened to Isaac Woodard. Terrible things happened to many, many African Americans under the system of Jim Crow. Um, although the story told in the book is properly the story of redemption of the people like Wadey's Waring, of people like Thurgood Marshall, right, who initially files a school equalization suit, but because of this chain of events, winds up filing, refiling it as part of the the suits that are consolidated into Brown versus the Board of Education. The redemption, of course, of Harry S. Truman and the redemption of America. Um, you know, you could tell a much more difficult story out of this narrative, and it would be a story of state violence. And that story, we're still in the middle of it. South Carolina, of course, was the scene of rampant violence, um, obviously stretching back to slavery, but for our purposes, um, stretching back to the Reconstruction period. There's a wonderful book called The Great South Carolina, Re this Great South Carolina Ku Klux Klan Trials. Uh, it's about the trials of the Ku Klux Klan in Reconstruction era South Carolina. There were so many murders and so much violence 
against African Americans that the effort to prosecute it simply overwhelmed the federal courts in South Carolina. Um, there's a continuing theme, right? The continuing effort to make the federal government effective in redeeming African-Americans and the country from state violence. Um, when I call it state violence, that these are not all, these are not private actors. You know, the kind of the local governments are, and the state level governments deeply implicated in it. And if I wanted to tell the longer story, I would tell it through the stories of people like Pitchfork Ben Tillman, famous South Carolina politician in the early 20th century who made his career as a populist. But to be a populist in South Carolina uh, was to be violently anti-black, as ben Pitchfork Ben Tillman was. I would tell it through the stories of people like Strom Thurmond, a longtime South Carolina senator who just passed away a few years ago. Uh, Strom Thurmond, of course, becomes a national figure because of the, Dix you know, he's the Dixie Cat crack candidate for president in 1948. But the chain of events that set in motion his candidacy is this, right? You know, right? so the story that Judge Gergel tells is the story of the redemption of people like Harry Truman. But of course, there was a reaction to Truman's civil rights policies in 1948, and the leader of that reaction was South Carolina politician Strom Thurmond, uh, who remained in politics and who remained, I would say, largely unredeemed. Um, unlike George Wallace, right, who reversed his own his earlier uh, endorsement of segregation, uh, who was praised by African Americans. Uh, by the time of his death, Strom Thurmond remained largely unredeemed. And I could go on through um, the Orangeburg Massacre of 1968, where state highway patrolmen shot 27 people uh, at the historically black South Carolina State University following civil rights demonstrations. There was a, yet another federal prosecution, which was also unsuccessful. I might note the 2015 shooting of Walter Scott by a police officer in, uh, I think it's North Charleston, um, one of the uh, shootings that ignited the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there was a state um, indictment uh, in prosecution of Scott, um, where, which uh, produced a hung jury of a subsequent federal prosecution. In my courthouse. Yes, in the federal courthouse, um, and resulted in a, a guilty plea. So, so there is this continuing story of violence and violent resistance to black equality in South Carolina as the center, not the center, a center of the story. And I would say that story, you know, I, I, I would be the last person to say, so you know, don't read me to say that you know, nothing has changed. I would be the last person to say that nothing has changed. You know, my relatives are actually from South Carolina uh, myself. I mean, I remember going there when I was a kid and, you know, talking to my, talking to my uncles and te them telling me about, like, what Jim Crow was, right? And he, my uncle telling me, you, you know, you could not disrespect a white man. And, you know, the uncle I sat with, you know, when I was a kid was somebody who now lived in a world in which he could hold his head up high. So we do live in a radically different world than that world. But there are also themes but that- But the world is not dead yet. Yes, it's there are themes dead. that persist. And you know, I'd like to think that we are in, the, the theme should be redemption in some measure, but of course there are other more challenging themes and I think the story of, of which theme uh, is, is the longer term one or the one we should emphasize uh, remains unresolved. Well, I will mention this, and I told Mr. Mack this, is that last night I was in a program with Chief Justice Ralph Gantz for the Massachusetts Supreme Court. And he came across very similar to what you just said, Mr. Mack. He said that what we were looking at was state-sponsored terrorism. Mm -hmm. And he and I then engaged in this discussion about what this meant. And it wasn't just that in many of these horrible incidents in the 40s, uh, and 50s, 
um, law, and earlier, law enforcement officers were often either acquiescent or complicitous, but then there were not prosecutions, which is a form of acquiescence itself to, um, to that violence. And, um, and I have, uh, Mr. Mack and I have had an email exchange. We've been talking ever since the uh, review, which he raised this issue. And there is a narrative. Now, I will tell you that um, in 1947, uh, 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 we had the uh, lynching of Willie Earl in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, which there was an attempt by the state to prosecute. It was the, 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 all the, many of the defendants had pled guilt and admitted their guilt, uh, confessed their guilt. They were acquitted. I've never figured out how that could happen, but <laughs> there it was. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then contrast that to the shooting of Walter Scott. Um, and the reason he pled guilty before my colleague David Norton was that he was going to be found guilty. The mm -hmm. FBI had done a great investigation. There was no question he was going to be convicted. And he pled in the face of near certainty. He didn't want to get a life sentence. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a difference. I mm -hmm. mean, um, both of them involved state violence by law enforcement officers. But there is a difference. But for those who say that world has, is gone forever, that simply isn't true. It isn't. We, we suppress it, and what we learn is, is that every time we seem to make a significant advance in civil rights, there is a response, right? There's a backlash. And we have to be ever vigilant because we need to keep pushing the ball forward because any, if, we, if we rest on our laurels, the, um, the um, response of those resisting will, will, will be allowed to rise back up. So thank you. Um, we, uh, we have about four minutes left, and I, you've got like wonderful questions, I'm sure. So, so questions uh, from the audience. Um, And when I saw the image of the students sitting outside the classroom, I went through that. And I had teachers calling me Negra in class. And I had children spitting on me. But even when I was sitting on that outside perimeter, I was thankful. I said, as long as I can hear it, I can learn it. It has taken me a long time to be able to talk about it without crying. And then to have you <laughs> talk about it today brought the tears. But I saw something in that school. I know that a lot of people say what you went through <clears throat> was racism. But what I saw was something different. And that's getting to what you were saying about there's a, a, a broader issue of violence. I saw violence in that school. Many will say it was racism. And I say, no. The same teacher who was calling me Nidra in class was also being violent to little white children. And the same little white children who were spitting on me in class and on the bus were also nasty to little white children. But that made me see that there had to be something bigger, something deeper than racism. And that is the journey that I've been on. I, from there, I went on and I, I was graduated first in my class out of Indiana University, first out of 5,500, Phi Beta Kappa. I went on to Oxford, got my first law degree, and then to Columbia, got the second law degree. And now what I'm doing is a segment, I taught at Stanford, by the way, and what I'm doing now is investigating the historical root cause of violence by and against lawyers judges and legislators. And you are right when you say that there is violence within the politicians, within legislators, that is done with impunity. And I'm sh focusing on 1790 to 1890, and I'm showing the violence. But I'm also going the next step and saying, what was the root cause? And that root cause at that period is applicable now. And only by identifying and correcting the root cause can we get beyond the violence. Well, it's very interesting. I, th I think one of the transformative um, influences of watching that, um, that trial of the um, acquittal of Lynn Woodshaw for the Wearies 
was it forced them to realize that under these practices, which they had largely kind of ignored, was violence. Yeah. That it's in the violence. end, it was enforced by yes. violence. That's and right. um, and that was the most hor horrifying thing to them, that they were that this was an evil institution, and that violence uh, lay right at the a spark. The incident referred to um, in, in, Col in Columbia, Tennessee, where the uh, Navy uh, uh, SEAL is, uh, is, um, is, is intent to lynch him because he challenges uh, uh, the treatment of his mother. Um, all these incidents with their violence was just around the corner. And that's why I thought it was important to remind people of that lynching flag. That was not you know, a half a day, one day it was out. It was out constantly because underlying Jim Crow was extreme violence. That's how it was enforced. So we, we are actually at one o'clock, and I know a lot of people have to go, but, but two things we should know before we thank Judge Gergel. Um, he's gonna be signing books right outside. So I know a lot of you probably have more questions for him, things you wanna talk about with him. So he's gonna be here for a bit. Um, and, and second, um, thank Judge Gernogul, our panelists, uh, Professor Tushnet, unfortunately I had to leave because he's teaching class right now. Um, and thank you all for coming.